Thank you, Janet. That was quite the introduction. Um, I hope I don't disappoint. Uh, before I start, I want to thank Joanna, Jerry, the Prep Skills team. This is a fabulous event. They put in a lot of time and effort to uh, make this worthwhile for, for all of you and for uh, the students and their, their families tomorrow or Sunday. So um, thank you to them. Um, as Janet said, my name is Ashley Thornburg. I'm with the NCAA Eligibility Center. For what it's worth, I went to St. Mary's College, not the one in California, the one in South Bend, Indiana. It's a very small, all-women's liberal arts school. I did my master's at Indiana University, which couldn't be any more different than St. Mary's. It's located in Bloomington, Indiana. It's an extremely large uh, public institution. Um, so just to, you know, for what it's worth, I know some people at these things tend to ask me, so. There, there's that. Um, wanted to give you guys um, an introduction to the NCAA and the initial eligibility process. I will have a booth. I'm kind of in the corner over here, so I would love to uh, provide you more specific information and answer any questions you have after the, the panel. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with the NCAA, we are the national governing body of college sports in the United States. We offer 90 championships in 24 different sports. Um, so there is a tremendous amount of opportunity to enhance your students' experience with athletics. There are over 460,000 student-athletes across all three divisions within the NCAA. Um, 11,000 of those student-athletes are international, of which 3,000 come from Canada. So Canada is by far our largest international population among student-athletes. Division I and Division II um, offer athletic scholarships. Um, annually, they offer about $2.7 billion in athletics aid a year. Um, so it may be an opportunity uh, to help families financially, um, as well as to enhance that, that overall experience that these students would have in the states. Division three is our largest division within the NCAA. However, Division three schools do not offer athletic scholarships. Division three schools tend to be smaller private schools. Sometimes they have a larger endowment, so they may have more opportunity to offer um, academic aid or need-based financial aid. So just because Division three does not offer scholarships, um, don't count them out. They sometimes have more money than our larger public institutions. It's important to note as we kind of talk about athletics and how we can integrate that into your student's experience um, that if a student is looking to become a professional in their sport, if they're looking to make it to the NBA, uh, the NFL, the MLB, folks, it's not going to happen, okay? 1%, less than 1% of those 460,000 student athletes that, that I mentioned will turn professional in their sport. Uh, so what does that mean for the other 99%? They've got to get a job, they've got to get a degree, and they've got to be contributing members to society. So at the end of all of this, the goal is not to be a professional athlete. The goal is to have an incredible four-year experience um, and leave with a degree and be able to be that um, outstanding contributing member to society. The Eligibility Center is what we like to call the front porch to college athletics. Uh, we are responsible for certifying student athletes' eligibility, both their amateur status and their academic status. So this is kind of the first step um, in, into the NCAA. When you are certified by the Eligibility Center, that does not guarantee that you will be admitted to an institution, nor does it guarantee that you will receive a scholarship. Uh, the Eligibility Center was formerly known as the Clearinghouse. So our main goal is to make sure that student athletes are academically prepared to succeed for their next four years of life at, at college. Um, generally, our standards are very, very low. However, uh, research has showed that if a student athlete is able to achieve those standards, they're more likely to get their degree in four years. So, so that is our purpose. Our other purpose is to make sure that all athletes entering the NCAA are amateur athletes, and we'll kind of talk more about what that means. Um, at my table, I have a couple... I don't want to knock the flags over. Um, I have a couple different pieces of information um, regarding the academic standards. Um, I have a brochure called Follow Your Path. Inside that, it outlines what the academic requirements are for Division I and Division II. They are slightly different. 
uh, for Division III student athletes in order to uh, play college sports at that level, uh, the student needs to one, be admitted to the institution and two, make the team. Um, for Division I and II, it's a little different. Um, first, uh, student athletes must graduate high school. That kind of goes without saying. Um, they are required to achieve a 2.3 core course GPA, and I'll discuss what a core course is here momentarily, and have the corresponding standardized test score. So in order to uh, be a qualifier at the NCAA, you must take either the ACT or the SAT. When I say a corresponding score, we call that the sliding scale, um, and that is basically, um, depending on what your core course GPA is, you must have the qualifying test score on, on this grid. So the higher your GPA, the lower the test score you need in order to be determined to be a qualifier. I talked about core courses. Um, for both Division I and Division II, you need 16 of them. A core course is one that is taught at or above the regular academic level at the high school um, in the subjects of English, math, natural or physical science, social science, foreign language, religion, or philosophy. So we're not saying that health courses, art courses, gym courses, those types of courses are bad. They're obviously needed for admission to the institution, um, especially if a student athlete is gonna major in something, maybe the admissions reps that are joining me here today would look at those art courses. But for purposes of athletics eligibility, those would not be considered a core course. Um, you need four years of English, three years of math, two years of natural physical science, uh, two years of social science, and then you can use religion, philosophy, foreign language, or any of the above mentioned courses to make up that 16. Um, to help you with uh, core courses, Canada does have a provincial list of core courses. I have a reference at my table that um, discusses exactly how you find Ontario's list of core courses. Um, these are set by the Ministry of Education, um, so they're right there for you if you're helping a student athlete plan for their future. Next page. Um, standardized test scores, as I said, we either need student athletes to take the SAT or the ACT. We will use the highest of uh, the scores in each subject matter, so if they take the SAT twice and score higher on English the first time, math the second time, we will use those scores. Um, it's important that those scores come directly from the testing agency. We cannot take those scores from a high school transcript or anything like that. They must come directly from the testing agency. So as they sit for the SAT, if they enter uh, the 999949s code, the test will be sent directly to the eligibility center for free. All transcripts from the high schools must be mailed to the eligibility center, and we will need years nine through 12, all four years. Uh, yeah, all four years. Um, and unfortunately, we don't have a way for Canadian student athletes to send those electronically. They must be mailed. I would recommend if you have a student athlete who's registered with the eligibility center to send those at the end of every academic year. Um, that way, when we go to issue a certification, all the information is right there, and it should expedite that process. There are amateurism rules that impact student athletes, and I will kind of briefly go over these. Obviously, an amateur student athlete is one that has not profited in any way from their sport. Student athletes are, prospective student athletes are allowed to accept up to actual and necessary expenses from their teams. So if they are in a tennis tournament, let's say, and it costs them $1,000 to travel and eat and lodge and play in that tournament, they can accept up to $1,000 in prize money. Um, but once they accept above what their expenses were to participate, um, they, have, they have jeopardized their amateur status. I get a lot of questions about the gap year or the grace year. So for all sports other than Division I tennis, they, they have to be different. Uh, Division I tennis and men's ice hockey, student athletes have one year after they graduate high school to continue to play in their sport without any impact. Um, but if they play past that one year grace period and do not enroll in college, uh, they will be required to sit out their first year. Uh, for men's ice hockey, that, that delay rule is until they turn 21 years old. There are a few uh, major junior A hockey leagues that I'm sure you're familiar with um, that the NCAA has determined are professional leagues. And student athletes from those leagues would lose their, their eligibility if they come to the United States. So, student, so hockey student athletes that play in the WHL, 
OHL and the QMJHL um, are, are not permitted to compete in the NCAA. Couple points to highlight as you are helping students register with the Eligibility Center and starting to navigate this process. Um, one of the most helpful things for you is the brochure that I have at my table. On the back, it breaks down years 9, 10, 11, and 12, and what we recommend student athletes do each of those years. So um, be sure to grab one of these. Um, the other thing is when student athletes register with the Eligibility Center, it's important that the student is using their email address, not mom or dad's, not yours, and to make sure that this is an email address that one, that, that works, um, and two, that they check. Um, unfortunately, we're not as cool as some some schools and some others. Uh, we do have Twitter and those sorts of things, but our primary way to communicate with student athletes is through email. So it's important that they continue to check that and that is a working email address. Um, if a student athlete registers and forgets their password, um, they simply just need to call us and we will reset it. Please do not re-register and pay the $80 fee again. There's no need for that. Um, and, and another important point, this is a new, uh, uh, um, technology enhancement. When you go to the Eligibility Center's website to register, um, there's kind of two choices, two paths you can take. One is for certification. So a student athlete will sign up, they will pay their money, and at the end of that they will receive an academic and an amateurism certification. If you have a student athlete who's like, ah, I'm just not sure, or is in ninth grade, and oh gosh, if I get bigger, stronger, faster, I may be able to make it, we do have what we call a profile option. So this is free, so the student athlete goes through the registration process. They do not have to pay, but they are in our system. So if they take the standardized tests, we have an account to link it to. Uh, we also have their email address, so we can send them information, correspondence, things they need to do in order to complete that that process so um, that's fairly new for us so I, I would advise everyone to take advantage of that um, if I leave you with anything it is where to get information um, the eligibility centers website eligibilitycenter.org is um, a tremendous resource um, when you go to that website up in the right hand corner is a link for high school administrators um, you will be linked to the core course list, you will be linked to um, something called the Guide to the College Bound Student Athlete. This has more information than you need to know. Um, a lot of times we get questions about, hey, can a coach contact me during this time, or what is the signing period? The recruiting calendar is in the back, the list of everything a student athlete needs to do years 9 through 12 is in there, and there's also another very, the sliding scale is in there. And if I can find it here, see I'm not very slick. There is a core course planning sheet where you can actually enter the course, the year, and the grade, and you can calculate yourself if a student athlete would be a qualifier or not. So this is a very handy guide that can be found through our website. The other piece of information that I think is, is going to be really helpful to you, in the booklet that you got from Prep Skills, um, towards the back, about uh, you know, one fourth of the way to the back, is some information on the Eligibility Center, uh, year, division by division, that Prep Skills has put together. They took this information directly from our website. It is spot on, um, so I encourage you to review that. Um, there is also material on our website that you can print and hand out. It's free at your school. If you, there's posters you can print. Um, there's handouts. All of these guides and brochures are on there. So um, there is a wealth of information available to you. So I know that was a lot of information. Um, I'm happy to take your questions after the rest of the panel speaks or uh, meet you over at my booth. So um, thank you very much, and thank you for taking time today to invest in the lives of your students. And um, good luck to all of you.